since that season. So I just want to say hi to our friends. Um, and then at this time in our services, normally when we go into a time of giving, and uh, we, don't nor- we don't pass around offering plates or anything anymore. Um, and so I just want to let you know the ways that you can do that. If this is your home church, if, you, like, if Renew is your church, um, we, we invite you to, to partner with us, to give to the Lord so we can continue to do this work. Um, you can do that by giving online. It's all set up. We do have an actual um, offering box in the back for those of you that like to do that. And then you can also mail in um, your stuff as well. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, I'm excited because today we are going to be uh, starting a new series. And uh, if you've been with us at all, you know that kind of the motto or one of the the sayings that we're going to be saying at Renew or that you're going to hear over and over again is this idea that every story matters, that every, everybody has a life story and their life story has affected who they are and that we believe um, that not just do we want God to enter into people's stories, but we actually believe that we are supposed to enter into God's bigger story for our lives. But we value uh, individual stories. We value um, the experiences that God has given us. And so I think it's fitting that we start Renew with a series called Every Story Matters. And uh, some of you might have noticed already that I don't have my Bible up here, which is really scary. If you go to church and the pastor doesn't have his Bible, that's a scary thing. I just want to acknowledge that. Um, and I'm going to confess that to kick off this series, it's going to be a little bit um, self-indulgent. And what I mean by that is I'm going to share a lot of personal stories um, tonight. And the desire behind that, the heart behind that, is that Melissa and I, we really strongly believe, we really strongly believe that God has a vision for this church and that part of that vision is helping people to understand that they are welcome, that their story matters, that they matter, that they have value regardless of their life circumstances And in order to do that, I'm going to share um, some personal stuff. Now, those of you that know me, that you have been coming to church with us for a while, you know that I really like to teach the Bible. I think it's super important that when you come to church, um, most of the time, the Bible has smarter things to say than me. And by most of the times, I mean all the time. You see, the lights just flickered when I said that because the Lord was like, really, John, you're going to do that? Um, But no, in all honesty, right, we believe that the, the Bible is the word of God. We like to teach it. And so as we continue in this series, we're going to be talking about um, encounters that Jesus and others have with people as, as he enters into their story. But tonight, I'm going to share um, some personal stuff, so it's going to be a little bit different. I have shared uh, here many times um, that I had what I guess you would call a conversion experience in the year 2000. Uh, when I was 19 years old, I've shared this a lot of times, when I was at college, I was a sophomore in college, and through a lot of circumstances that to this day I would still call miraculous, that God was guiding and directing my life, I was not following the Lord. I grew up in a Christian home, but Jesus was not a priority for me at all. God started to enter into my life. He started to intervene, and he started pointing me in a direction that ultimately, uh, one night uh, on my bedroom, on my bed in my dorm room in Graham Hall, room 404, this is cool, um, I don't know what to do. It's, yeah, this is it's it's lights. Um, we'll just roll with it. I'll just try not to have a seizure. Thanks, John. Um, under the watchful eye of a certain Victoria's Secret model named Heidi Klum, in the form of a poster on my wall, I gave my life to Jesus. And unfortunately, I have vivid memories of that poster. But that's true. Heidi Klum was in my room. It was me and Jesus and Heidi uh, when I gave my life to the Lord. And I remember. And I, you guys are like, you guys know her from America's Got Talent. She used to be talented at other things, but um, I, 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 is that inappropriate? I don't know. My, my, my parents are here. That was kind of embarrassing, but the truth is, is that I remember uh, vividly. I just, I was on my, on my dorm room bed, and I was just, I was just, I had this overwhelming sense that I knew that I wasn't living the kind of life that God wanted me to live, and that I was sorry, and I just said over and over again, God, I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry for the way that I'm living my life. This is not what you desire for me. I'm sorry. It was very simple, but it was very profound, and it literally changed the trajectory of my life. I know that not everybody has those types of experiences, and that's totally okay, but for me, it was a very real moment that occurred in that dorm room. That summer, um, I got a job working at Winco Foods in Moscow, Idaho. I was working the night shift, and uh, I, I literally, um, all my roommates had, they were gone for the summer. There wasn't a lot of people around, and so I would work the night shift. I'd come home, I would sleep, I'd wake up, and I would read my Bible. I just started, like, digging into the Word of God. My, my mom, I think, had bought me a, a commentary on Matthew or the New Testament. And, and so I started, like, reading that, and I was learning stuff I had never learned before. I spent that summer just, like, devouring the Word of God and working. And then when I came back in the fall, I got connected with um, a campus ministry, so kind of like a youth group for college kids. And prior to that, I didn't have any real, like, spiritual influence at college. I didn't have anybody that I was connected with. I was the, I was the only Christian that I knew at college until I 
um, sort of joined this youth group, this, this college ministry. And uh, I have really fond memories of that, that ministry. I was really grateful for the things that, that they taught me. Um, it was really the first time I was a part of like a, a, a community <laughs> where we just studied the Bible like intensely. I went to Bible studies. Um, there was a lot of training. Um, it was a really sweet time. Like people poured into my life. Um, and one of the things that they really focused on was evangelism. So they were really big into evangelism. And um, one of the ways that they did that was that they, um, kind of the methodology that they did is that they would go to, um, on campus, you'd go in the cafeteria, the lunchroom, you'd walk around campus and you would look for somebody who looked lonely and needed Jesus, and then you would have a conversation with them. And you would approach them and you would talk to them. Um, and we have kind of this whole, like, script even, and this little booklet that we went through. And, uh, and honestly, like, it was, a, it was interesting for me. It was something that I hadn't done before. Um, but in, on top of sort of learning about how to share my faith, you know, we'd ask spiritual questions. Um, I also, like, studied or went to a lot of, they trained us on, like, what we call apologetics, so, like, defending the faith. So I learned how to, like, have conversations with people, but I also learned, like, okay, if you say this and they say this, then you come out over the top with this kind of a thing. Does that make sense? So there's kind of like this, like, you know, if, if, if they say this, then you come at them with this. And uh, in some ways, if I'm being completely honest, it, it ended up being kind of like a, a spiritual game of, of gotcha at times. And so uh, an example would be, like, um, we would ask this question. I think it's a good question to ask, but we would ask people, if you were to die today and you were to be standing at the gates of heaven, should God let you in? Would God let you in? And uh, 100% of the time, people would say, yes, of course. And then I would follow up with this question of, of why would you go to heaven? Why should God let you in? And, and 100% of the time, people would say, because I'm a pretty good person. I mean, I haven't killed anybody. That's like the pretty standard response. And I knew if they said that, then I got them. I had them right where I wanted them. And so I would do this thing where I would go through the Ten Commandments, and I would say, okay, like, let's just say that there is this God, and, and let's just say he's holy and good. Like, can we agree that, like, God might have some standards? And they'd say yes. And I'd say, let's just, like, for example, let's just use the Ten Commandments. And so... I say, have you ever stolen anything? Well, yeah, I've stolen something. Have you ever lied? Well, yeah, I, I've lied before. Have you ever coveted something? Well, yeah, I've, I've coveted. Have you ever murdered anyone? Well, no. Well, did you know that Jesus said if you hate somebody in your heart, then you've murdered them? Well, have you hated someone? Yeah. Have you ever committed adultery? No, I'm not married. I can't commit adultery. Well, did you know that Jesus says if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery with her? And on and on. And as we would go on these conversations, sometimes you would just see their face kind of change. And at the end, I would say, you know, you told me you're a good person, but by your own admission, you are a lying, thieving, adulterous, coveting, murderous, <laughs> murder, uh, you know, person who takes the Lord's name in vain and, and dishonors your parents. Are you still a good person? You know, gotcha, right? Like, that's what it would happen. And, and, and sometimes, if I'm being honest, it was just like, you know, they would like cry uncle, like, okay, you got me, now what? Well, now I've got this prayer that you can pray and you can be saved. Like, that's, that's kind of how it went. And, and ultimately, like, the goal, of course, was to, to save people from, from hell, from eternity, you know, to, to bring them into the kingdom. Um, we kept detailed st statistics on, like, how many people we shared the gospel with. It was like we counted numbers and let's keep track of how many people we share faith with and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you might be thinking, some of you might be thinking, well, like, what's wrong with that, right? Aren't we supposed to share our faith with people? Aren't we supposed to tell people about Jesus? Well, I think there's a couple things that were wrong with that. Uh, number one, um, on the very rare occasion that somebody would say, yes, I want to receive Jesus, uh, after I tried to follow up with them, they would ghost me. And this is before, like, you had cell phones and you could actually, like, ghost people, like, on text messages. So, like, I'd just call and leave voice messages and people wouldn't respond. I'd see them on campus and they would, like, go in the opposite direction. Uh, it just didn't seem to be, like, very effective. Like, people might say the words, but I'm not sure that anything really happened in their heart. But more significantly for me um, was that there was a lot of concern, a lot of urgency placed on sharing your faith with people, but there did not seem to be so much concern on the people themselves. It was this, like, concern with, I've got to share my faith with as many people as possible, but do I actually care about this person? Maybe I care about their soul, but do I actually care enough to listen to them? In all of the training that I received, and it was a lot, like I did a lot of training, I don't recall, and I'm saying I may have, but I just don't remember ever receiving any kind of training that taught me how to ask honest, open-ended questions with people and just listen to their story. It was really me getting at what I had and my agenda on them. And I want to be, uh, in fact, I remember this one time, like we were kind of like strategizing about like, you know, who we were going to evangelize to. And and one of the leaders had said, hey, we should focus on um, students that come from uh, foreign exchange students. Because if we can reach them for Jesus, then they can go back to their countries and they can share Jesus with other people. It's like the mission field 
coming to us. So we should become friends with uh, foreign exchange students. And I remember thinking, like, uh, if I'm being completely honest, like, it felt maybe a little bit gross inside to me that, like, I was, the only reason I was going to befriend these people was to tell them about Jesus so they could go and tell their friends. But I was, it was, I was told that basically, hey, listen, Jesus strategized. Jesus had 12 disciples, and then he had three ones, and there's this whole system, and you got to be strategic in what you do. I want to be uh, really, really clear about something. Uh, I loved this ministry. I still love this ministry. Uh, they poured into my life. I think that they genuinely cared about me. I know, I know for sure that they did, and especially those that believed. They absolutely poured their life into. But there was still something that I felt was missing relationally, and I actually think a lot has changed since then. Uh, in fact, this was 20 years ago, and there was a lot of ministries that operated like this. There was sort of this burn or turn mentality that I have something to share with you, you have a decision to make, and if you don't want to make the decision that I want you to make, then I'm going to shake the dust off my feet and move on to somebody more valuable. So after operating uh, with this idea for a number of years, thinking that it was just simply my job to share Jesus with as many people as possible as often as I could, um, I started to realize that life wasn't as simple as I thought it was, that faith wasn't as simple as I thought, that it wasn't as simple as checking boxes, yes or no. Uh, now, I do believe, I want to, again, I want to be clear, God works in all kinds of ways. There are many people that I believe genuinely entered into relationships with him through these types of conversations. Um, but as I kind of matured a little bit in my faith, I just started realizing, man, I, it, life isn't as simple as, as this or that, as A or B. When I was 25 years old, uh, I was living in an apartment in Brown's Edition in Spokane. Uh, me and my roommate Scott had this apartment, and this was before Brown's Edition was cool. If you don't know where Brown's Edition is, at the bottom of the hill when you're going into Spokane and you get off Maple, on the left-hand side there's this little community there with the Rosars and some stuff. And it's super hip and cool and trendy now, but when we lived there, it was super scary. And uh, we, we rented this apartment. It was one of these old houses that had been turned into apartments, and so we rented the top one. And our apartment was 375 square feet. Uh, which is about the size of my living room in my house right now. And it had two tiny bedrooms and like a kitchen slash living room, you know, like you cook your food where you watch TV. It was really gross. But it was tiny and it was cheap. It was $187.50 per person per month, um, which, was, which was cool for me at that moment in my life when I was 25. Down below us lived this um, old lady uh, named Marianne who had quite a life story that I'll share with you some other time. And then in the other apartment was this single dad, uh, named Eric and his eight-year-old son, David. And Eric was an alcoholic and threw parties every single night. And it was just a strange, we encountered a lot of interesting stuff living in Brown's Edition. At that time in my life, I was working um, two jobs. I was working for this place called Lutheran Community Services. I was working with foster children. And then I was also working at this um, homeless shelter for teenagers called Crosswalk, run by the Volunteers of America in downtown Spokane. I was also going to this church called New Community. New Community um, used to meet um, where Summit U is, if you know where that is, down at, by the Northern Lights Brewery. Um, and I was super involved with church. I was young and single, and I pretty much just served and served and served my guts out at church. And uh, I remember this one time on Sunday, uh, my pastor came up to me after service, and he was like, hey, John, there's this kid over there, and he's kind of acting strange, and he says he needs some help, and you seem to know a lot about, like, um, kids that are struggling, so would you go visit with him? I was like, sure. So I went over and talked to him, and this kid was probably... I mean, he was 6'1 or 6'2, and he could not have weighed more than 115 pounds. I mean, he was just rail thin. He had this, this mohawk. And uh, I couldn't tell. He, he was pretty strange. I couldn't tell, if he, honestly, if he was on drugs or if it was mental health. I didn't know. But we just started having this conversation. And he tells me that, that he just turned 18 three days ago, that on his 18th birthday, his parents had kicked him out of the house. And so he had been staying at the Union Gospel Mission, which is just right around the corner from that church. And then something happened there, and he can't stay there anymore. So he doesn't know where to go. So I said, well, why don't we, why don't we go to lunch? And, uh, and so we, we went to lunch together, and he told me that his name was Brian, um, but that his street name was Skeeter. Everybody called him Skeeter. And I didn't know what a Skeeter was, but I thought if there ever was a Skeeter, this guy looks like a Skeeter. And uh, he was just a real unique kid. It was a very interesting conversation. And ultimately, he was just like, hey, can you drop me off downtown? And I was like, sure. And I thought that I had done, like, my good Christian duty. Uh, you know, I was nice to him. I bought him a meal, and I dropped him off, and I would never hear from him again. But I told him, um, I gave him my phone number and said, if you ever need anything, just give me a call. Well, 10.30 that night, I get this frantic phone call. And at first, I couldn't make out, like, what was going on. He's like, it's Skeeter, it's Skeeter. He's like, can you come get me? Can you give me some guys trying to kill me? And I was like, what? He's like, some guy's trying to kill me. I'm in an alley. Can you come get me? And I'm like, sure. And so I, you know, hang up the phone. I talk to my roommate. I'm like, hey, Scott, um, can I go pick up this kid? He's like, 
yeah, um, I'll hide the knives and anything he can kill us with. And he did. Like, he hid all the knives in the house. And so I went and I picked up this kid. And we, we brought him back to our little 375-foot square apartment. And, uh, and I'll never forget, uh, he took off his shoes in my apartment. And the stench was unlike anything I had ever experienced in my entire life. Uh, the, the, this, it was top two. You guys want to know what number one is? Of course you do. Number one was when I was in, uh, serving at Hurricane Katrina. We were cleaning out houses that had been flooded for months, and it was like, like 100 degrees, hot weather. And we were cleaning out this one house, and this freezer full of old seafood broke open and fell onto us. And that was the number one smell, but this was like a close second. And uh, his socks were literally black. They were literally black. And I remember I had to go out onto the balcony. Like, it was, it was not good. Um, but, you know, he asked, like, can I stay here for the night? And like, I don't know what to do, right? So, yes, you can stay here for the night. He stayed the night. The next night he asked to say the same thing, uh, to stay again. And short story is he ended up living with us for about six or seven months. In the first few weeks um, that Brian was with us, uh, I, it was a steep learning curve for me. I took him to the welfare office. I had never been to the welfare office before. I hadn't ever applied for food stamps and, and what they call GAU, government money to, for disabilities. And I entered this whole process I didn't really, I wasn't a social worker at that time yet, so I didn't know that process, but I just tried to figure it out. Um, Scott and I took him to all his appointments. We tried to help him uh, get to school. He was still a high school senior. He was going to school at East Valley High School, and so we figured out. I'd never, I had never taken the bus before. I know it's embarrassing, but I always had a car. We learned how to take the bus together. He would get on the bus at 6 a.m. in the morning and go all the way to the valley and go to school. I learned that he was in a, a special education program there. As time went on, um, I started to learn more about his history. Um, he would share little nuggets about his life. And uh, I could never quite, it became pretty clear to me that he had some type of disability. And I don't know how much of it was cognitive, how much of it was emotional, mental health. But uh, he really struggled with, like, um, I guess impulsivity. He, he was not able to think through actions, which I know is common for, like, most 18-year-olds. But in particular, he just did not seem to be able to, like, predict, like, what would happen if he made certain choices. Um, but he started to share with me little bits. He shared with me that his father had been um, pretty physically abusive with him. He shared with me that his, his parents had split up when he was young, that his mom was living in Canada uh, at the time, and that he really liked her but hadn't talked to her, like, I, I want to say, like, in a, in a couple years maybe. Like, it had been a long time. Um, and uh, the more I got to know him, the more I just started to understand the hardships that he had come from. At one point, I had to go to his dad's house, his dad and his stepmom, to try to get his birth certificate so he could get into services. And I remember his stepmom and his dad said to me, why are you trying to help him? He's not worth your time. He's just a troublemaker. Um, and I could just rem- I could see, like, sort of the anger in them. I, but I could also see probably that they had had to put up a lot with him. I don't really um, remember how, but I was able to track down his mom um, and to connect him. And so they started talking on the phone. And she and I actually became kind of friends she was um, in an abusive relationship up there, but she loved Jesus, and she just expressed, like, such gratitude for me, me and my roommate that we were helping out her son. It was super hard. It was always, like, one step, you know, what is the saying? One step forward, two steps back with him. It was, like, just when we would get him in a position to be successful, he would do something to sabotage it. Um, he became a little bit of, like, kind of like a celebrity at my church, which was kind of cool. One of the neat things was to see, like, all my friends start loving him and wrapping their arms around him. And he was just so eccentric and said the funniest, weirdest things that usually involved cuss words, like, publicly in church. But people just loved him. And, uh, and, and so it was neat to see that. Well, one night, uh, I came home late. I came home probably, like, 1 o'clock in the morning. And, and Brian was there um, with his fiance um, that he had, I think, met that day. Because that's how it works when you're on the streets. And, uh, and this other girl. And then I heard, like, two people in my bathroom that was, like, this big. And uh, I was like, who's in there? And he's like, oh, that's my friend and his girlfriend, and they're taking a shower. And I was like, mm, that's not happening. And so I knocked on the door and gave him a towel and said, basically, get out. And I asked these girls how old they were, and they said they were 14 and 15 years old. And uh, that was not good. I didn't need to have 14 and 15-year-old girls in my apartment at 1 in the morning. And so I told them, I'm going to call your parents. I'm going to take you home. And I remember I, I, these girls got in my car. These are the things you do when you're 25 and single uh, and just trying to love Jesus. But I took these girls in my car. And I remember, I remember vividly one of the girls, like, drawing smiley faces. It was cold outside. She was, like, drawing smiley faces in the window, and, you know, on the frosted window. And this other girl said, you know, I'm so thankful that you're taking me home because I was really scared. And I can just remember thinking, like, what are these girls doing at 14 years old in some random dude's apartment at 1 in the morning? And I remember when I called her mom her mom didn't seem to care that much, and it was pretty shocking to me. Well, after a while, um, Skeeter kind of struggled to follow the rules a little bit, the rules that I was putting on him as a parent of an 18-year-old. And uh, 
And so eventually we just decided, like, it was probably best, you know, he'd find another place to live. He got really involved with a ministry called Cup of Cool Water in Spokane, and they really wrapped their arms around him and loved him. And so we helped him get into this place called the Otis Hotel, which was a low-income housing for people with disabilities, and, uh, and he lived there. Um, we stayed in touch. Brian kept coming to church sometimes. In fact, we threw a surprise birthday party for him on his 19th birthday. We have a, a picture. Um, this is the only picture I could find of it. Um, the guy on the right, I don't know who that is. Um, <laughs> But he was incredibly handsome with way too long of hair. Um, but that was me approximately 300 pounds ago. And this was Skeeter. And he was, that's about what he looked like all the time. And he was just this tall, skinny kid. Brian taught me a lot about love, about giving to those who can't give back, about sacrificial love. Uh, and I think more than anything, he began to teach me that life wasn't as simple as I had made it out to be. That I started to learn that people's life stories, that their life experiences really affected their outcomes. Brian was not somebody who was ever probably going to become a pastor. He was probably not ever going to lead a Bible study or disciple a bunch of people. He was not somebody that I was trained to invest my time into. And yet God had him in my life for a lot of reasons. And I enjoyed my time uh, with Brian. After two years, uh, two years after meeting him, uh, I was hired as an investigator at Child Protective Services. Uh, that's not something that I ever thought that I would do. I didn't go to school to be a social worker. In fact, uh, I, I went to school um, and I got an education degree. But I wasn't super interested in teaching. And so as I said before, I, I went down and I served six weeks uh, for Hurricane Katrina cleanup. And that was the first time I had done, like, physical labor in, like, a long time. And it was, like, super good for my soul. I just really liked it. It was hard work. So when I came back to Spokane, uh, much to the dismay of my parents who paid for my college education, I opened up the newspaper and was like, I'm going to find a physical labor job um, that pays minimum wage. And so I, I looked in the paper, and uh, I got a job as a carpet installer helper. Uh, so learning how to install carpet. So I got hired there making $7.50 an hour. And that was really hard work, but really good work as well. The crew that I worked with, um, uh, they were a pretty rough, a rough group. <laughs> I was this pretty naive young Christian kid trying to serve Jesus, and they had all done stints uh, in the pen. Is that what you say? I don't know. They went to jail. They had <laughs> that, that's how hardcore I was. Like these guys were in the pen, um, and uh, you know they were, but they were good guys. And one of the guys had had uh, he was like my age, like 25, and he had had I think his fourth or his fifth child. And I knew he was struggling, like, financially. So I organized this diaper drive at my church. And I went to an awesome church, and they were super supportive. So they, like, announced it, and we, we got all these diapers for this family. And uh, after the service, this guy approached me, and he was like, hey, like, what do you do for a living again? Every time I see you, you're, like, trying to help people. And I said, well, I, I lay carpet. And he's like, I'm a supervisor at Child Protective Services, and I think you'd make a really good social worker. Do you want to be a social worker? And I was like, no. And he was like, how much do you make? And I was like, seven fifty. He's like, do you want to make three times that? And I was like, I'm listening. And so... <laughs> Uh, he helped me to apply, and uh, I remember, like, I remember I was laying carpet. I was out of my dirty clothes. I changed. I went to this interview that I thought I totally bombed. I didn't know anything about CPS. Like, I didn't know anything about that world, uh, but two weeks later, they called me and said that I was hired, and so I got hired as a CPS investigator, and uh, pretty quickly, I was immersed into a world that I previously did not know existed. Uh, I knew on the periphery, I had worked with foster kids, I had worked at the homeless shelter, so I knew like a little bit, but I, I, I was not prepared for um, what I was about to experience. And the way that it worked was you would basically get a, a piece of paper on your desk in the morning um, called a referral. It was on blue paper, and it would outline um, allegations of abuse. So it would de describe what was happening. Somebody had called in, a, you know, that a child was being abused, and then my job was to go out and to investigate and to talk to um, the kids and the teachers and everybody around to figure out if abuse was happening and then to try to keep the child safe. And uh, let me just say this. Um, as I said earlier, nothing could have prepared me for, for what I experienced. Um, I learned pretty quickly that people are capable of far worse things than I had ever imagined. Um, it was a pretty, a pretty dark world. And early in my career, I think I was probably pretty good at judging people. Uh, I would read these reports, and I would think that these parents are awful people, they're wicked people, they're evil people. But over time, I saw this pattern, something started to happen. You see, I had access to all these records. And so what happens is then when a parent comes into the system and you start reading their stuff, what I started finding over and over and over again was that that 28-year-old mom who was abusing her kids was once a 7-year-old little girl that was being abused herself, and then a 10-year-old girl who was being sexually abused, and then a 14-year-old girl in foster care, and then a 16-year-old pregnant girl. And I saw this cycle over and over and over again. And the more that I got to know people's stories, 
compassion started to come in. Not to excuse what they had done or were doing. That's not to make excuses, but there was a little bit more understanding of perhaps why they acted the way that they did. Uh, later on in my career, I was able to move into foster care licensing, which is what we call like the promised land because you are working with like high functioning people who usually want to do really good things. They want to become foster parents. We have several foster parents here in our community. And, uh, and part of that job was to do these things called home studies. And so I had to write these 20 page reports where I literally would sit in your living room and you would have to answer questions about every area of your entire life. And then I would write it down and put it on paper for you. And uh, that was a really eye-opening experience for me for a lot of reasons. Number one, I, I realized pretty quickly that everybody has a different story. Everybody's got a story, and none of them were the same. I never sat down and somebody had the exact same life story as someone else. But more importantly, I just realized that there was remarkable stories. There was stories of perseverance, of, of abuse that was overcome, of successes, of failures, people that had done all kinds of famous stuff, people that were millionaires and had lost everything. Like, there was just incredible stories that came out of the lives of ordinary people. And what I found was that a lot of these people didn't realize how amazing their life was until they read their own report. I'd have to write this report. They would read it, and they'd be like, wow, like, you made me sound really good. I'm like, no, I just wrote, like, your life story. And what people started to realize about themselves was that they had a story to tell and that it was, it was unique to them. And what I realized was in doing that was as I learned to know people's story, as I spent time listening to the lives of people, I was better able to serve them. I was better, better able to understand where they were coming from when they would experience the challenges in the foster care community. A lot of times I'd be able to say, hey, they have this experience and I think that that might be affecting what's going on. And you might be thinking like, well, what's the point of all this? Why are you spending your entire sermon talking about it? And here it is. I have a couple things that I want to say. First is this, is that we have to recognize that our life experiences significantly impact our views on faith in God. Our life experiences significantly impact who we think that God is. I know that seems self-explanatory and everything, and yeah, of course it is, but I think that in the Christian world, we often forget that this is the case. We forget that people are shaped by their experiences. Sometimes we talk to people as if they should automatically believe what we want them to believe, and when they don't, we're surprised, right? Just believe it, right? Like, don't you understand you're a sinner and Jesus died for you? Like, believe it. Turn and burn, right? It's not that simple for some people. People have been spiritually wounded, you would not believe the amount of people that I have talked to, that I have interviewed, that I have listened to their life stories that have been hurt by people in spiritual positions. Mothers and fathers who were prominent members of churches who people had no idea what was going on behind the scenes and kids who have a lot of resentment because of people who say, I'll never follow God again because if that's what it means to follow God, then I'll never follow God again. You see, for a lot of us, we've been changed by the gospel. The gospel is good news to us. The gospel is good news to me, but the gospel is not good news to everyone at least not always upon hearing it for the first time. A lot of times there are people that are many steps away from coming to know Jesus, and it takes time to know them and to know their story to slowly see God working in their life and bringing them into relationship with him. That leads me to my second point, which is this. If we really want to know, if we really want people to know Jesus, then we must first be willing to listen to their stories. For far too long, the church has approached the world in a manner that says we have all of the answers. We don't care what you have to say, just listen to us. It doesn't matter if it's faith or politics or science or parenting or sexuality. We love to hear the sound of our own voices, to force our views on others to our own detriment. For too long we have judged the way that people live for their sinful lifestyles without any understanding of why they are the way that they are. We simply haven't cared. We have shown little interest in why people do what they do, but we are so quickly to tell them where they're going if they don't stop it. I shudder to think about the amount of people in this world that have been pushed away from Jesus by Christians who think that they are acting in righteousness on behalf of God when in reality they are treating people in ways that Jesus called hypocrites in whitewashed tombs. And I shudder to think about the people that I have pushed away. And it's taken these years of journey for me to understand. And I want to be very clear about it. Some of you probably have a lot of questions. We're going to explore this in this series. Are you saying that everybody's truth is their own? No, no, no. We're going to talk about every story matters is not relativism. It doesn't mean that there isn't truth to be known. It doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't want to invade the lives of people. But I think that we are learning as a culture that for far too long we have just been barking at people and nobody wants to listen anymore. And we need to listen to the hurts and the wounds that people have experienced. The last thing I want to say is this, is that every story matters to God, 
Every story matters to God, therefore every story should matter to us. I think that part of being a follower of Jesus is this, is that we have this deeply held belief that God cares about every single person. We believe that God, that every single person is made in the image of God, that they have God's stamp on them, that God created them, that he loves them, that he has purposes for their lives. We believe that God cares about people. I think that's what it means to be a Christian. Therefore, by extension, because we are the hands and feet of Jesus, we ought to care about every story. What that means is that every single person who steps foot at Renew Church of Cheney needs to know that they are loved and cared for and valued. That we're going to have conversations, that we're going to talk, that we're not going to judge you the moment you come in to the door. We're going to save that for later. Just kidding, sort of. I really believe, you guys, in my life experience, listen, I'm I'm one person. This is my life that I've lived. I want to be very clear about that. But I have come to realize in my life, the more fruit that is born in my life is when I listen to people and enter into a relationship with them than when I just yell at them. Like, that's just the truth. We're going to talk. We're going to unpack some of this. I'm 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 going to talk to you about some of the questions and concerns that I'm personally having. When I read through the Old Testament sometimes, to be honest with you, uh, it doesn't seem like God cares about everyone. That's something that I'm exploring, that I'm working with. I'm meeting with some, some professors of mine that I've studied under in the past to try to better understand what does it mean because I want to be able to say in confidence, and I believe this is true, that Jesus cares about everyone. I think when we look at the life of Jesus, it's clear that he cares about everyone. Even the Pharisees, the people who he, he butted heads with far, he cared enough about them to try to tell them, listen, you're going down a dark path, you've got to turn around. I think that Jesus is for everyone And I believe that this church needs to be for everyone as well. In 2009, uh, I got an email uh, from Brian's mom. She said that Brian had moved uh, to Texas with her. And uh, they had reconnected and that he was going to church. And uh, I think he was 21 or 22 years old. And uh, he was working as a roofer. And there was an accident, and he fell off the roof, and he died. And I say that just to say that, like, I don't know everyone's life story. I'm not God. I don't know, like, what, I don't know what God has planned for you or for people, but, like, I know that my calling is to love you, to be kind to you, to tell you, to tell you about Jesus. You know, we just never know. We, this is the point I'm trying to get at. We never know what someone is going through until we sit down and talk to them. We never know. And once we start to hear people's stories, I believe the Holy Spirit comes into that conversation and helps us to guide that person towards healing based on the life experiences that they've had. And in this series, I want to explore uh, times that Jesus entered into the lives of people where he met them where, where they were at and he showed them how much he loved them. Would you pray with me? Jesus... Thank you for setting the example of who we ought to be, which is truth tellers in love. That we are to reach out to those who are far. And God, I pray that this church would not be full of whitewashed tombs who sit on thrones judging people, but that we would sacrificially enter into the lives of every single person who walks through these doors, that they would know that they are cared for and loved and valued by you and this community. Jesus, this church will fail if it is not led by you. And so we ask that you would lead us and guide us for years to come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? Here at Renucini, we often do what's called a benediction, which is where I just speak words of life over you. May we be men and women who know that every single story matters, and may you be a man or a woman who knows that your story matters to God. Thank you guys for being here on this very first Sunday. We're so glad that you're here, and we hope to see you next week. Enjoy the rest of your evening.